And now we have a simple example. It almost looks like a, a math example, but we're going to apply it to the distribution of gases now. It's like a statistics problem, you know. It's, it says, imagine if there are 20 gas particles move, uh, in a box. Two of them are moving at 200 meter per second. Three of them are moving at 220 meter per second. Five of them are moving at 250 meter per second. Four of them are moving at 270. Three of them are moving at 290. Two of them are moving at 310. One of them is moving at 330 meters per second. What is the most probable speed? What's the average speed? And what's the root mean square speed of the particles? Okay. VP is the quickest. You basically look at the distribution of the gases and you say, where is it peaking? Which speed is there where there are the most number of particles moving at that speed, you know? So it's almost like a diagram. In your mind, you're almost making like a histogram. You know, this is 200, uh, there's two of them. Uh, 220 uh, is three of them. So it's like a little histogram that you're making. You know, then you're gonna have 250. You're gonna have five of them. Right, and then you're gonna have 270, and then so it goes down. Then you're gonna have 274 of them. This kind of makes sense because usually the increase of the speed is uh, the drop of the speed is not as fast as the increase. So it, it looks like a bell-shaped curve. You know, it goes up, it peaks, then it starts to go down, but it but it doesn't go down as fast as it went up. It kind of starts to plateau. You know. Uh, the more gases you have, the more gas particles you have, the more like a, that behavior, that bell-shaped curve it should have, right? Uh, so then you have here uh, 290, then you're going to have uh, 3, right? Then you're going to have here uh, uh, 310, there's going to be two of them. And then there's going to be one moving at 330. Something looking like that. So, of course, the graph is peaking at 5. I didn't really need to draw this graph, but the drawing graph helped us visualize it a little bit better. So you can say the most, most probable speed is 250, right? That's where it's peaking at. 250 meters per second. Okay, so what's the average speed? Okay. So the average speed is you're going to say, well, there's two particles moving at 200, so you multiply them, uh, 2 times 200, then 3 times three, uh, 220, plus 5 times 250, right, plus 4 times 270, plus 3 times 290, plus 2 times 310, plus 1 times 330. All of that in the numerator, right? So that's where we did V, N, V, D, V, 0 to infinity, right? When we did our uh, derivation. We integrated it all the way from 0 to infinity, and we divided it by N. This is what I'm doing, but I'm not integrating 0 to infinity because I only have these data points, right? So then I'm going divide to divide this by the total number of particles, which is 20. Right. 0.5 meters per second. Oh, wow. You see, it came out to be slightly higher than V probable. You see? So, then, 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 like this. V average. And if we find the ratio of the two, V average over V, that's 260.5 over 250. So, let's just see. I'll divide that by 250. 1.04. So about 4% larger, the average speed, than the most probable, okay? We're, remember, it was supposed to be 12.8% larger in the theory section. Well, that's if we had infinite number, of, um, and that's if we had large number of particles. It doesn't have to be infinite, but it has to be a large number of particles over uh, all the velocity distributions from zero to infinity, right? Then you approach that 12% higher rule, but I'm okay now, 4% larger, okay? Now, how do you find the root mean square velocity, okay? So then how are you going to do this? You're going to do uh, V squared is going to be, then you're going to square this, 
uh, 2 times 220 squared plus 3 times, uh, sorry, no, no, this is 2 times 200 squared plus 3 times 220 squared plus 5 times 250 squared plus 4 times 270 squared plus 3 times 290 squared plus 2 times 310 squared plus 1 times 330 squared divided by 20 particles. Once I get that, then I take the square root of all that. So then there's a V root mean square equals square root of that. You see? Okay. So this is going to be a huge number now. So what happened is the average of the squares, this is called the, the average of the squares of the velocities. See, the average means the average, the, the square. Notice the average includes the square under there. The bar should be large. It's not the, it's not the square of the averages. If I square the averages, I would square the 260.5, right? What would you get if you, if you square the averages, right? If you square this one, you're squaring the average velocity. You would get 260.5 squared. You would get 6.786 times 10 to the fourth. But this, this is the average of the squares of the velocities, right? So the average of the squares. And then what I'm getting is 6.9135 times 10 to the fourth. No, this is larger. This is 6.786 times 10 to the fourth. This is 6.9135 times 10 to the fourth. It's a bigger number because it's the average of the squares, not the square of the averages, right? So then I'm going to take the square root of that Okay, a lot larger, you see? So then you're gonna see here, V root mean square, 262.9 meters per second. Okay, how much larger than this is, is it? V root mean square divided by V average. Uh, so then I can divide 262.9 divided by 260.5. 1.009 ratio. It was supposed to be about 5% larger, I think, if I remember correctly in the theory section. But again, that works if you have a lot of particles and the distribution of the velocities is all the way from zero to infinity. But what we did show is that the root mean square speed is larger than the V average. It will always be larger, okay? And this is the correct speed of the, the that depends on the temperature of the gases. This is the most this is the most uh, important speed. So it is the square of the average of all the squares of all the speeds of the particles. It's kind of hard to say it. This, the, av the square root of the average of the squares of the speeds, right? So it's a long sentence, okay? In this root mean square speed, we can find the kinetic energy of those particles, right? The kinetic energy of the particles is one half mv root mean square, uh, speed squared, right? So uh, if I wanted to know the total number of the kinetic energy of those gases, right? Imagine if uh, each particle that was moving there, just to make it simple, imagine the mass of each particle was one gram. And just to make it simple. So we can say here we had 20 particles and if they were all the same mass, so we would just say 20 particles one half, and then the mass of each was one gram, so 0 0.001, and then the root mean square speed, 262.9 squared. That will tell us the total kinetic energy of all 20 particles, right? So we can see. Okay, so the total kinetic energy of the those 20 particles would be 691.35 joules, okay? So then you can kind of see how the connection of the root mean square speed allows you to find the kinetic energy, right? The other speeds cannot help you find the kinetic energy because they're not related to the kinetic energy, right? You couldn't just simply take the 260.5 and square it 
right? And then multiply it by 20 to give you the kinetic energy. That would not be correct. And you couldn't take the 250 and square it, multiply it by the m and find the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy only depends on the root mean square speed, right? The 262.9 squared. And the next step, I can use this to find the total uh, temperature of the gas, right, uh, of those 20 molecules. So then I can say here the kinetic energy is 691.35, that's equal to the number of particles, right, times uh, 3 halves kT. Remember that uh, these particles we're assuming have three degrees of freedom, that they're moving in the x, y, and z direction, right? Each degree of freedom will give you half kT and then you, the the total kinetic energy will equal 3 halves kT, but this is the kinetic energy per particle, the 3 halves kT. Then I have to multiply that by the number of particles, which is 20. So I have 690.35, 20, 3 halves, and then the Boltzmann's constant, times the temperature of the gas. Right? In other words, the temperature of, of the gas only depends on the kinetic energy per particle, this thing. So either I take what I calculated and divide by 20, or I can just calculate what this number is, and that will be similar to taking this and dividing by 20. Well, since I know the total kinetic energy, including the 20, is 691.35, I can just take that for now and then divide it by 20, right? So I have 691.35 divided by 20, and then that will calculate this thing, and then that will equal 3 halves 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 T. Right? So then that's going to be, I get 1.6699 times 10 to the 24 Kelvin. So I get some ridiculously high temperature. Well, why did it come out so big? Well, we're modeling these particles uh, as like individual particles moving at those speeds, right? And we said their mass is one gram. In re this is not really realistic. The one gram particles are not particles. They're combination of a lot of, lot of particles, right? So this kind of proves that why on the atomic level particles can't be that heavy. If, the, if these were elementary particles and they were one gram and they were moving that fast, the temperature of the gas would be very, very high. In other words, you would have to heat up that, those 20 particles so, so to a temperature so high in order for them to be moving that fast at 200, 220, 250. That's very, very fast, right? for particles to be moving at. So it really doesn't make sense. The uh, particles that are one gram would have to move a lot, lot slower, maybe two meters per second, 0.2 meter per second, then we could, it could be realistic. Or we can say they are realistic particles and then make their masses a lot, lot smaller. If their masses are a lot, lot slower, then this number joules is going to be a lot, lot lower, right? And then the temperature is going to be a realistic number. So you can kind of see this is a, a backward way of proving that uh, elementary particles can't be that heavy and still move that fast, okay? So you can kind of see from this example, a good example of calculating Vp, V average, V root mean square, showing which one is larger, and then showing that the root mean square is always the largest, and then using that also to find kinetic energy and temperature, okay? Thank you very much.